Certain places hold special meanings for different people. They bring to us a sense of childlike wonder, a newness that reminds us of our first times exploring the world and journeying into nature. For us, North Manitou Island is one such place, a place full of adventure and mystery which swirl together and satisfy in us a deep longing for the past. A place that allows you to quench the thirst of nostalgia. On a bright morning, we got prepared for an adventure to a place we've been wanting to revisit for a long time. Did you find something good? It's personally, it's like an edible, edible plant. Kind oh of my sad. god, we found something edible in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> we headed out and made our way up north. As we drove, we passed under looming thunderclouds and carefully navigated through heavy rain. But as the storm cleared, we found ourselves in Michigan. We passed by Midland, Michigan, where our cousins and late aunt used to live. Though we were making our way closer, we still had a long drive ahead of us. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bored am I? <laughs> 10. As we neared our destination, we saw the waters of some inland lakes and arrived at the hotel that we'd be staying at for the night. I was looking forward to some hotel waffles during tomorrow's continental breakfast. I hate to break to you, Rob. I didn't see a waffle maker there. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Not bad, not bad, yeah. How's the view? <laughs> could be better, could be worse. <laughs> oh, oh, it's a little firmer than I expected. Later that evening, Robbie left to pick up some pizza for dinner at a local spot. So I was just planning on getting one pizza, but it was buy one, get one free, so we got two pizzas. <laughs> get in on this, Andrew. Mmm. Mmm. Hunger is truly the finest of spices. <laughs> this is way too much pizza. <laughs> the pizza definitely hit the spot. After dinner, I practiced some kung fu, and we all lazed around. What's everybody's hotel archives entertainment strategy? Random YouTube videos. <laughs> YouTube algorithm, take the wheel. The next morning, it was a gray, rainy day, but we were nonetheless excited to get our adventure started. But suddenly, I got a call. Okay, so we just received some unfortunate news. Due to wind conditions, they had to cancel all the boats today. So we've rescheduled for tomorrow morning, but that leaves us with an entire day to figure out what to do. Andrew already had stuff to do. <laughs> Since the ferry was canceled, we decided to hike the dunes today, possibly staying at a campground for the night. Now, we got in our car and headed out to Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. Before our hike, we enjoyed some leftover pizza. This is the most family vacation thing we've ever done. <laughs> like, this is just like a vacation we would take that as a family. so accurate. <laughs> <laughs> leftover pizza out of a plastic bag <laughs> just by the car. So you can't even be mad at the situation. Plus, I just, despite what it looks like, it actually feels really good. Yeah. I mean, how can we come to this area and not do the classic doom mm -hmm. We say that like it was a thought that occurred to us until we were forced to do it. 
Oh, there's a bee in the water. After those shenanigans, we made our way to the start of the dune climb. As we hiked up and saw the view behind us, we remembered the past times we had been here. So we've been here at least three times now, but we've never actually taken the trail all the way to the end, which goes all the way to the lake. I think today we'll do that, it's not that far. The weather gave this unique landscape an even stranger feeling. It feels kind of desolate in a way. Just the weather and the fact that there's less people than usual. It's very cool though. Going to those sand dunes and like the non-optimal weather. It's turned out surprisingly nice. And growing from the dunes was a beautiful plant. All around these dunes, we're seeing this shrub called baby's breath growing. It's native to like Central Europe and Asia, but it's interesting. It like gives the hillside kind of this bluish or lavender color, especially when it's contrasted with like the green color of all the grass in the dunes. But if you take a close look, it's got a really beautiful kind of lacy look. But I'm also wondering like if there was as much of this last time, because I, I feel like I don't remember seeing it. I don't remember being nearly this green. I remember the grass, but the bushes look new to me. So this is another wildflower that is growing everywhere. Um, and it's called bladder campion. If you look closely, like the ova of the flower are kind of inflated like a balloon. I mean, this plant is native to Europe. Apparently in some parts of Europe, they even eat it. So I'm not exactly sure how you would prepare this, but these uh, little bladder bits do look kind of fun to pop in your mouth. <laughs> Along with wildflowers, tall trees stood among the dunes. So these trees with the shaky leaves are a type of poplar tree. This one in particular is an Eastern cottonwood. I know that because the leaf shape has kind of this flatter bottom, but also I remember last time we were here seeing all of the fluffy seeds getting stuck in the little divots in the sand. But also down here, there's a plant called milkweed. It's got this really nice bundle of really intricate looking pink flowers. Milkweed is a plant that's really important for butterflies, especially the monarch butterfly. But on top of that, it's often thought of as toxic because it has this like milky sap. But in reality, you can actually eat this plant. Uh, some people can eat it raw, others might have an allergic reaction. But uh, at various stages in the plant, you can boil and cook to the different parts. And we ate those before, right? Yeah, we've had the seed pods especially, and I don't know if we've ever had like the flower clusters, but the seed pods will be coming in soon, so. It is amazing how much easier it is to walk on this when it's wet. And the sun not bearing down on us, it makes such a difference. That's true, I hadn't even thought about the fact that we're not super tired because of the sunlight. <laughs> it's weird how when places are so ingrained in your like consciousness and your development as a person, we haven't been here in a long time, but it actually also feels like we've never left. Although we enjoyed the nostalgia of revisiting this familiar landscape, we were excited to explore the parts of this trail that we had never seen before. We continued on through the rain, making our way towards the coast of Lake Michigan. Along the way, I spotted an interesting plant clinging to the sandy soil. So I'm seeing this shrub growing here and there. I just noticed it has these berries growing off of it. And this is actually something called sand cherry, same family as actual cherry trees and cherry plants. I have no idea what these would taste like once they're ripe, but all the berries are green, so it's definitely not good to eat yet. Uh, but it's just really interesting how certain plants that are related to things that we're really familiar with can take on a completely different form in a different environment. I also saw a more familiar plant growing among the dunes, grapevine. Up ahead was a steep, sandy downhill. This is going to be a lot easier going down than it is coming up. <laughs> it's really fun going down here. <laughs> I feel like I'm bouncing around. Huh? I do. <laughs> so this point right here is like kind of a nexus between two points of pain. Uphill this way, uphill that way. Now, we trudged up the incline, and at the top, we could see Lake Michigan in the distance. We gazed out into the horizon, seeing all the dunes we had yet to explore for the first time. Even in the drab weather, this landscape seemed to pop with color. The warm tones of the sand, the pastel blues of the water, 
and the vibrant greens of the surprising amounts of vegetation. Some of the dunes were covered in creeping plants and a variety of shrubs. We saw some cedar bushes and some spotted gnatweed to name a few things. I guess it makes sense, but it seems to get a lot greener the closer we get to the coast. We continued on towards the lake shore, coming across sections of dunes that almost looked like meadows. As we hiked, we noticed several things, like these ants trying to take down a beetle. There were also some St. Lucie cherries. I don't know what this feels like. It doesn't really remind me of anything. This is pretty unique. Well, this is a nice little alcove. If this wasn't on the main trail, you could just like set up shelter right here. It'd be so cozy. I feel like a hobbit in Hobbiton. <laughs> The amount of biodiversity in these dunes was stunning. The drab weather seemed to bring out the vibrant green hues of the environment around us. We'd finally found our way to the shores of Sleeping Bear Dunes where we gazed out into the turquoise waters of Lake Michigan. Above the water surface, Caspian terns soared around in search of food. The view of the lake seemed both exotic and familiar. We've seen views like this so many times, but each time it's in different conditions. And right now the lake is just like this beautiful turquoise green color. Yeah, you can even see uh, South and North Manistee Islands out there. And looks like it's pouring rain over there. So I guess they had a good reason to cancel the ferry today. There's also a barge way off in the distance. That thing is huge. Various waterfowl flew around as we sat on the beach and watched the thick clouds roll by. Maybe part of why this looks so unique to me right now is this is the calmest I've seen it in a while. Yeah, that's true. It is also kind of surreal lighting. It's kind of like one of those paintings you see of the sea, like the clouds are just kind of tumultuous, but it's still nice and clear here. I would also say, typically, you know, when you walk up to the shore, it's windy. It just gives you that feeling of like kind of chaotic a little bit. It just feels so peaceful with the water and the wind just kind of calming down. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like we're in a different dimension or something walked to like a completely different realm. What's want some granola. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we headed back inland, hiking past clusters of milkweed and patches of horsetail. hike back, I was still struck by just how many different plants were growing all around. So this is called an evening primrose. I don't know the exact species, but you see it's got these really brilliant yellow flowers. And these flowers, if you spread them out, will have four petals. But actually the flowers are edible, so they kind of taste like, uh, you know, nothing. But <laughs> <laughs> You've had them before? Uh, yeah, I've had some that grow around Columbus, and they're really delicate, but like a nice addition to salads because of the color and stuff. cool breeze rolled through the air. The weather had cleared up a bit, making our hike back even more pleasant. 
And on the way, I saw a beautiful tree common in these parts of Michigan. So along with the cottonwoods, there's also a little patch here of uh, paper birch bark trees. First of all, I love them just because they have this brilliant white bark that really stands out from the background. But as all of you will probably know by now, birch bark is really good for starting fire. But of course, if you collect birch bark, you want to find a tree that's already downed rather than picking it from a live tree. Or at the very least, just grab pieces of bark that are already like flaking and falling off. As we made our way closer to the end of the dune climb, we saw a familiar landmark off in the distance. So that farmhouse right here, I remember the first time I came here, I was looking at it, and it just looks so idyllic. I kind of had this moment where I realized that the world could look really beautiful the way that it looks like in video games and movies and things like that. For some reason, after I was a kid and, you know, you lose that childlike sense of wonder about the world, I just for a while didn't realize that the world was capable of looking incredible and, and beautiful and having all these amazing places. Just between the amazing sand dune landscape and I remember seeing like sun rays shining through the clouds and seeing this like idyllic looking farmhouse in the middle of a field. At the time, it was really, really striking. So for us, this place holds a lot of sentiment and, and meaning. It was a really pivotal moment in our discovery of our love of nature. Now back at the trailhead, we sorted through our gear and rested a bit. Uh, no. ah. oh, I lost all the ground. I was telling Andrew, <laughs> it's like if you wanted to curse your enemy, just curse them to wherever they walk, it's walking on sand. <laughs> <laughs> the hike had been surprisingly exhausting due to the sand. We watched seagulls soaring around the parking lot while we planned our next steps. We also saw a grackle hopping around on the ground. For now, we decided to head back to the car and drive through a scenic area in the park and check out a 450 foot high sand dune that we had climbed down and up several years ago. We pulled out of the parking lot and headed over. After driving through a stretch of forest, we saw a few overlooks of Lake Michigan before pulling into the parking lot for the huge sand dune, where Andrew saw a familiar looking tree. So this is a American linden or basswood tree. In the springtime when the leaves are tender, you can use those for a salad. You can also make tea with these weird looking seed things. I and mean, it's got some medicinal properties too. So. so right now we're going to this 450 foot drop off of a sand dune that goes straight into Lake Michigan. And our first time here, I was like, way out of shape back then. <laughs> we made our way all the way to the bottom, and then when I climbed up, I was so exhausted. Robbie had to come back down and push me up. <laughs> we approached the dune, and we were shocked at just how steep and tall it looked. Nearby was a sign warning visitors about the strenuous climb. Yeah, that seems insane that we ever went to the bottom of there. We walked over to an overlooked deck to get a better view of the dune. We have to all the way down. Wow, why did we ever go down there? That is impossibly far. Looking at this now, having hiked up mountains and stuff, I'm like, this wow, is this crazy. Is. <laughs> why would why, why would we have ever gone up there? I'm just thinking like, I did this already, huh? I'm done. It's like, I don't need to prove it again. <laughs> After that brief stop, we headed back to the car to figure out our sleeping arrangements for tonight and whether or not we'd be staying at a campground. It's like 40 some minutes from the campsite to the Manitou Transit. Yeah. And an hour and 20 from the hotel. Yeah. So assuming we even just spend like 20 minutes packing up our stuff, which is gonna be wet, because it's gonna rain. Good point. We're gonna, we're only saving ourselves like 20 minutes at the most, right? We're doing a hotel tonight. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay, well, hotel, hotel archives, archives episode two. <laughs> 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 Woo. Maybe it was the weather but it didn't take much for us to rationalize why staying at the hotel another night was the better choice. But once we were there, we were sure we had made the right decision. I will say it is nice. <laughs> I, don't, I don't regret anything. <laughs> once again, we ordered dinner, and Robbie went to pick up our food. Today, we are having some classic American fare. Sandwiches, burgers, potato skins, and chicken fingers. Oh yeah, look at this bun. Look, this is like, like, it's a, like a food filet commercial. It's like a fish bun, yeah. <laughs> You tried your sandwich with it? Mm hmm. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> by the time we actually go camping, <laughs> we might be sick of civilization by the time we're actually camping. <laughs> Before heading to bed, we worked out our plans for tomorrow now that we had one less night to spend on the island. The 
next day, we woke up at the break of dawn and headed out to our car. We all good? Yep. It was still a gray day, but thankfully, things had calmed down a little bit. We grabbed our bags, went to the docks, and boarded our ferry. I think one of my favorite things is riding a ferry. Yeah. Doesn't matter where we're going, doesn't matter how long we're staying. <laughs> It's going to be super cold. We're going to have to go back down, but i got to start out at the top. <laughs> it started to rain, and we may have made a horrible mistake being up here. Brian is going to be laughing. <laughs> Now, the ferry made its way out of the docking area, and before long, we were cruising along the water. How's it feel so far? It's fun. I like the speed and the movement of the ocean. I mean, the lake. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Every time I get on a boat at the beginning, I'm like, mm, this is great. And then after like 45 minutes, I, I'm done. <laughs> I, this will probably be the same. <laughs> the water was still very choppy today, and the boat rocked back and forth on the waves. It definitely didn't sway this much last time. No, right? definitely not. Yeah, definitely. It, man, it's swaying hard today. Yeah. I almost slipped off my chair. <laughs> Eventually, we could see both North and South Manitou Islands in the distance. Okay, we're about five minutes out from South Manitou Island. The ride smoothed out a lot. Yeah. It was yeah. really choppy at first, but it's not bad at all right now. And not nearly as cold as I thought it would be. Yeah. We approached South Manitou Island, where several campers were waiting on the docks to board the ship. Most of the passengers disembarked, and Andrew and I moved to the lower decks with Brian to stay warm. It's much warmer down here. Dude, South Manitou is much more popular. Oh wow, yeah. It's like the whole boat emptied out. We asked Brian how the ride down here had been. It wasn't too bad, actually. Honestly, the worst part was just when the boat would tilt, like exceptionally, like you could see the water come up to the window. <laughs> You're like, oh God. And actually my feet got wet because it was splashing down here. Yeah. Down here, the water was still choppy, but not so much that it prevented Brian and I from taking a small nap. Yeah, it's been two and a half hours. Wow. Ooh. A few people have gotten sick. <laughs> I actually feel fine somehow. I'm usually like the first to get car sick. I don't feel too bad. I'm just cold and tired. We neared North Manitou Island, eager to get off the boat and onto solid ground. Finally, we had reached the docks, where there were again several hikers who were waiting to board the boat. We, on the other hand, were relieved to get off the boat and breathe in some fresh air. Good to be off that boat. <laughs> Nothing like solid ground. <laughs> we made our way to the island and looked forward to a much more pleasant experience. After a brief orientation, we reviewed our hiking route. We would hike south, re-exploring parts of the island we had been to, then continue to the western coast. Then we would hike north and cut through the centerline trail to make up for the lost day. Oh my god, I'm so ready. <laughs> I'm so ready to move. It looks mostly just like I remember it. Weather's a little different, obviously. Yeah. We passed by some of the old houses that had been built on the island decades ago. 
Alright, so which of these buildings are we staying in? <laughs> <laughs> which are these hotels, if you will? Okay, so we're gonna head south, just take us left, same way we went last time. Near one of the houses, I saw some day lilies. So these lilies obviously were grown here, you know, for the house. You can uh, actually eat these unopened flowers here. And it's actually a traditional like Chinese medicine and food that, you know, we use in soup sometimes. But you can also just pick it right off and eat it. Up ahead, we saw a sign marking one of the houses as a private residence. Well, I don't think someone lives here currently, but I think it's like owned by someone still. We continued on, examining the different buildings and guessing what they had been used for or how long ago they had been built. That building kind of gives me like a church or a school vibe for some reason. This one, it's weird how those stones are like in such good shape. We also saw a lone brick chimney and a bird's nest. With one building in particular, we were impressed with how good of shape it was in and wondered if it had been restored. They did something to preserve it, but I don't think they would have built anything new at all. Unless this one's like being maintained for some, some, for some historical purposes. I also wonder like when were these houses built? Because in my mind I think the 50s, but I also wonder if maybe it was more recent than that, like the 80s or something. This old sidewalk right now. <laughs> kind of cool. Well, this is hiking. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, we entered the wilderness section of the island. These wild forests were more our speed, and it didn't take long for me to spot an interesting mushroom. Yeah, this mushroom has kind of like a watermelon rind or cucumbery smell. It's definitely old and worn out, but this is an old dryad saddle, which is an edible mushroom that first comes out in the spring, but grows year round. The recent rainfall meant there were all sorts of mushrooms sprouting up around us. As we hiked, we noticed several fallen logs, some of which may have been blown over by the recent storms. A little more debris and foliage than I remember. Well, the first time we came here, it was so sunny and bright and everything felt so open. And now between the weather and also like, I don't know, there's just a bunch of stuff that's been overgrown and a bunch of stuff that's fallen from a storm. It feels a lot more imposing than it does, did last time. Mm, yeah, that's true. But I'm sure we'll come to some really nice open areas soon. All through this area are patches of thorny uh, blackberry bushes. And we're still early in the season, but you can see that there's some blackberries coming out here. They're still green. Down in Ohio, all of them are starting to ripen, but we're further north, so. But another thing about the blackberries is if you look at the cane, it's kind of got this ridgy looking stem. If these were wild raspberries, the stem would be smooth and covered in powdery mildew. Over here is a favorite plant of mine. This is mullein, and the leaves are super soft and fuzzy, almost like woolly lamb's ear. But it grows yellow flowers that you can use for tea, and supposedly it has really good medicinal properties for your like lungs and respiratory system. Up ahead, we saw a sign marking the location of a historic building. So that school that we were talking about earlier, it was originally here, and they're going to be rebuilding it. It says, unique place-based education. Is that pole where it marks it? Oh, okay, yeah, you can see some uh, remnants. We looked around at the different objects in this area. Yeah, you can see some old foundation or something over there. Some cement on the ground. So there's also a lot of sumac bushes growing in this area. And you can see there's some that have these red little things coming out of them and some with these more yellowish whitish things. Now all of this is staghorn sumac. These red fruits are actually good to eat. It'll taste kind of lemony and sour. Whereas the white and yellow ones are actually the flowers of the same plant. But you don't want to confuse that with poison sumac which bears white fruit. But yeah, if you just pick some of these fuzzy little berries and pop them in your mouth, they taste nice and sweet and sour. So this is an interesting tree. It, when you see its seeds, that kind of gives away what it is. This is something called American Hop Horn Beam, and it gets the name because these actually look like the hops that people use in beer. I don't think it works the same way, but it has a really similar kind of look to it. Hop um, Horn. Hop Horn Beam. Okay. Yeah, I don't know who names these trees, but they always have weird names. <laughs> so what is this tree up here that looks really out of place compared to everything else? Yeah, so this is an eastern hemlock. It grows all throughout, like, Southeast Ohio and some of the foothills of Appalachia. We've seen it on a lot of our camping trips. I mean, you can make tea with it. It's not the poison hemlock that, you know, we think of. And actually a lot of times if you are in need of firewood, you know, usually we take our firewood from the ground, but if you're in an emergency scenario, 
a lot of times there will be a lot of nice dead branches that are perfect for starting your fire. You know, I think uh, this is a clear sign that this island needs to be more inhabited because it's like just in the middle of these little beach saplings, you have this giant oak tree growing. And that doesn't happen typically in a natural forest. Eventually, the trail took us out of the forest and through meadows. On the way, we saw an amazing campsite being used by some other hikers. Either way, we still had a lot of ground to cover before we could settle down for the night. Next, the trail took us to a large meadow that we had camped in last time we were here. Feels like coming home in a sense. For old time's sake, we decided to stop for a snack break in this meadow. The weather was warming up, and in the tall grass, we saw monarch butterflies resting as well. In this field, I'm noticing there's all these trees in the apple and, and rose family. And if you look closely at some of the fruits growing on these trees, some of them are infected by something called cedar apple rust gall, which only affects the fruits of apple trees, but also cedar trees. But yeah, I think this is more evidence that this was once an area that was lived in and made home by human beings. <laughs> Now, we continued on through our old campsite. That was the tree you used. Yeah, we camped yeah, we right camped in here. Right around here. And you were like definitely over on this side. Yeah. I don't know how we didn't just become tick food. <laughs> I don't either. In the forest, we saw a small toad, and Andrew spotted some wild edibles. There's all of these stalks sticking out of the ground. You can kind of notice them from a distance, but these are the flowers of wild leeks, or wild garlic, also called ramps. So if you were to dig under here, you would find a nice bulb that you could use to eat. Although when I harvest ramps, I prefer doing it in the spring when the leaves are out and just collecting some of the leaves so that you don't kill the entire plant. I think that's a much more sustainable way to use them. And up ahead, I found more interesting flora. Oh, hey, over here, there are mushrooms called Mirasmus. At least that's the genus that they're in. So these are these really tiny, delicate mushrooms. Some of them more common mushrooms, but they look really pretty when they're all clustered together. They're kind of like tiny little umbrellas or parachutes. We also saw some wood, stained blue by the green elf cup fungus. From here, this is all new, I believe. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. This okay. is uh, the furthest we'll have ever stepped out of Hobbiton. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another plant over here, which is uh, not very good to eat. And in fact, if you eat the berries, it'll probably make you incredibly sick or kill you. But yeah, this is called doll's eyes. The leaves kind of have this like distinct serrated look. The berries later in the summer will turn white and they'll still have that little black tip on them. Right now they're green, but later in the summer they look just like these creepy eyeballs. And actually the stalk connected to the berries turns this like weird organic red color. It just looks like this weird like Cronenberg kind of plant monster. We continued on, passing by some old oyster mushrooms and some familiar plants. So suddenly along this trail, there's a patch of common plantain. Not to be confused with the plantains you buy at the supermarket. This is a plant that was introduced to the Americas by the original Europeans who came here. And actually a lot of the indigenous people who lived here called it white man's footprint. Not only because it was introduced by Europeans, but also it tends to grow in really compacted soil, um, which is why you often see it in like, you know, parking lots and lawns and things like that. And obviously this is like ideal environment for them because all the soil is being hiked on and compacted. But it's good for uh, skin ailments like bug bites or rashes. You can just take the leaf, chew it up, and apply a poultice. I also spotted some woodier oh, yeah. fungi. Yeah, as we probably know by now, this is an edible fungus. Is that a, do you know if that's a white woodier or regular? I, think, I it's, think it's a white woodier, because the regular ones are always a darker brown, right? Yeah, it's probably a different species. There's also some violet tooth polypore here, which has some nice coloration. We kept hiking through the forest, exploring the vast sections of the island we had never seen before. We saw some horse hoof fungi on a tree beneath the bright forest canopy. And despite not hiking much, we were already feeling a bit tired. I've been softened too much by hotel archives. This is the easiest trail we've ever done. And I keep thinking to myself, mm, I'd really like to stop and take a break. <laughs> I was looking forward to eating a sandwich. <laughs> but before eating lunch, I had to examine some edible mushrooms. So growing at the base of this tree are what looks like uh, coprinus mushrooms. I think it's coprinus comatus or the inky cap. 
these mushrooms are edible. They kind of have like a neutral mushroom taste. But if you eat alcohol, it has a bad reaction with the mushroom and you can get sick from that. So make sure you're not drinking alcohol. But they're called inky caps because as they grow, they eventually start to dissolve themselves into this black goop. And that's how they spread their spores. I'm also noticing some of these mushrooms have like a hole right at the top. And I'm assuming there's some sort of like bug or slug that's been eating them and maybe it like eats through the stem. But uh, it's pretty interesting. There were also some more oyster mushrooms growing from nearby trees. I think we're about to enter into another clearing. I just see this bright golden color through the leaves. The trail on the island kept taking us from the woods into small patches of meadows. Eventually, we reached a junction where we decided to stop for lunch. Oh man, I'm very happy to be sitting down. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait to eat one of these squished sandwiches. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> White bread, eh? That's I'm doing wheat. <laughs> <laughs> Peanut butter and mango jam. <laughs> mango jam? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that existed. Break mm -hmm. me off a piece of that. <laughs> it doesn't taste super mangoey, but good. this is not going to taste as good. Though. <laughs> mm. It yeah. doesn't have a very strong mango flavor. Yeah. It's mostly just. It's like a sugar flavor. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think so far? It's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. We actually really lucked out on the weather. Yeah. A lot of rain the past few days, so it's kind of cool. Also, the rain means that all these mushrooms are sprouting now. And less bugs and mosquitoes. Mm. After lunch, we decided to hike off the main trail to check out a cemetery, and Borniques, a landmark marked on the map. The trail took us out of the forest into an open meadow that made us feel like we were in a completely different place on Earth. I almost feel like we've kind of like walked out onto the bald of a mountaintop. If you squint your eyes, it feels like you're looking kind of down at forests and lakes and stuff. Like the shape of the clouds just makes me feel like that. Amid the tall grass, Fern Frond sat waiting to unfurl. Further on the trail, Depressions of sand rested between the grassy hills. Wow. We approached the cemetery, which had a registry posted on a wooden sign. So most of these people died in the early 90s. One of them was like, 1988. Oh, wow. I don't see anything in here. It first felt sad and solemn to walk among all these gravestones, but there was also something cheerful about the fact that such a beautiful island could be one's final resting place. Isn't it cool to think about that maybe someday we'll be in a grave and somebody else will be visiting it? <laughs> yeah, why, why is that not cool? Because <laughs> <laughs> it means I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> now, it was onward to the next landmark. Um, up ahead is Borniques, which, uh, some building or a house built by somebody who owned a ballroom dance studio. Along the trail were some trees left behind from the orchards that used to grow on this island. I was walking by and I noticed that this tree is very clearly an old apple tree. Now I don't know how good the apples are to eat, especially at this time of year, but we had a tree in our yard growing up that was really similar, produced some similar green looking apples. This is probably going to be more crab apple -y than apple-y, but Really astringent, but it's actually not that bad. Looks like a Granny Smith. You wouldn't write home to your mother about this, but <laughs> it's an apple. <laughs> we continued hiking through open, sandy meadows. High above, a bald eagle soared through the sky. The trail now took us to an area more densely packed with trees. We found a sign pointing in the direction of Borniques. Oh, I do see something. Man, it makes you wonder how, like, did people literally just walk like three miles to get to this building? Oh, this is a full-on house. That still looks nice. 
Why is it still in such good shape? It must have been one of the more recent, a couple of decades more recent. Like there's clothes hanging there. Like there's people have been in this building. There's lumber in here. This has definitely been restored. Now we went around to the back of the house to explore more. This home was built originally in the early 1900s by Alvar Bornique, a summer resident who operated a dance ballroom in Illinois. In the backyard was also an old shed and an outhouse. We were all feeling tired, so we decided to sit and rest a bit. It's a combination of getting up really early, but also the three hour boat ride. But I'm very tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something about it, I just feel completely drained. The improvement in weather has lifted my spirits enough that I can keep going. It would be cool to just sleep out here if you could. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta sleep right here. Oh. You guys just wanna take like a 10 minute break then? Yeah. Yeah. As we sat here, we looked around at the nature surrounding us. A white-tailed deer frolicked through the fields in the distance. Meanwhile, ants investigated a fallen comrade, and growing in the grass nearby were some edible sheep sorrels. After resting for a while, we got up and headed out. On our way out, we hiked by a collapsed structure and then went on a search for an abandoned car that was supposed to be nearby. There's supposed to be a trail that will go off somewhere this way and there's a car marked on the map, but I'm not sure if this is the trail or what. Actually, I do see what looks like a trail here. Okay, this is probably it. We followed the trail to the beach where we were treated to an amazing view. I don't see a car, but this is very beautiful. <laughs> Not wanting to give up on finding the car, Robbie explored what might have been an old, unmaintained trail. This looks like it could be an old path, but it's kind of hard to tell. Yo, bear. This looks pretty promising, at least as far as it being a trail. This is definitely an old trail. If there's actually a car here, that's a whole nother story. I have no idea. I'm not seeing anything thus far. Yo, bear. Guess there's no bears. But. <laughs> Found something. Well, well, I suppose if we want, I found a campsite. A little bit creepy, a little bit out of the way, but a campsite nonetheless. No car though, I wonder where the car was. Nothing. Huh. Okay, heading back. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So I kind of gave into the sunk cost fallacy and I just kept going and going and going. No car, but I did find a campsite. It was kind of creepy looking. <laughs> there was like a volleyball underneath the bench. Nobody was there though. Now we headed back to the main trail. Along the way, Andrew found a vibrant looking fungus. At first glance, I could see how someone might confuse it with like chicken of the woods, especially because it's got this orange coloration, but the edge is kind of brighter. But the underside of it is also orange, whereas on chicken it would be a lighter color. And it's much smaller. And I don't know the exact species, but this is something in the cinnabar polypore genus. Uh, cinnabar, I think just because of, you know, the, the color of it is such a deep cinnamony color, so. It doesn't smell like cinnamon though. <laughs> Headed this way? Yep. Next campsite we see, let's just take it. There was another landmark called Stormer Place marked on the map, and we discussed whether or not we wanted to check it out. I say we continue. Yeah, there's a place called Fat Annie's that might be worth going to. That's kind of more open. Maybe find a campsite there. Yeah. 
We wandered deeper into the woods before finding a sign pointing in the direction of Fat Annie's. Oh, is Fat Annie gonna deliver? I don't know. I just see sunlight and I assume it'll be nice, but yeah, looking closer, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> Let me go a little bit. Up. All right. It looks kind of uphill too, which uh, doesn't sound great. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait for you here. Okay. It looks like there's open areas, but it's all kind of hilly. Whoa, there's a deer right there. Open as in a open canopy, but I don't know if this is the greatest camping spot. Okay, this, this we could possibly work with. I feel like it's a matter of whether or not we want to just camp up here or keep hiking to the coast, because I don't think we're going to find that much better in between here and there. I'll go tell the other guys though. I returned to the main trail to describe the campsite to the others, so we could decide whether or not to stop for the day. It's nothing like mind-blowing, but I'd give it like a B plus. So the question I guess is, do we want to stop here or try and keep going till we reach the coast? I kind of doubt there's going to be anything between here and the coast, and that'd be about like 1.2 miles. I feel like the coast will definitely have good campsites. Yeah. Especially this map literally says on here that people who do the whole loop, they camp on the west side of the island. So if we can just get to the west side, then we could probably find something. Yeah. That was a decent campsite, but I don't think we're in desperate enough of a situation. I don't think so. So at this point, it's um, less than a mile. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe we just take one one more break here, 10, 15 minutes. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Boost I think we still morale. got plenty of time. It's only 6.50, so. Okay, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we rested for a bit and then continued on. We hiked through another half mile or so of forest. Eventually, the trees started to thin out. Definitely looks promising up there. Yeah. What's it say? Oh, trail? trail. Yeah, this is where we'll go tomorrow. Up here, I think, is an overlook, but Let's maybe there's out. a campsite up there too? Yeah, Come sure they look. The trail had brought us to the beach where we were treated to amazing views of the lake and the setting sun. Wow. You can go down to the beach even. Oh man. As amazing as the views were, now we had to look for a place to camp. Okay, so Brian went to scout further up north on the trail. I just came from over here. Campsites galore with the best view you could possibly imagine. <laughs> that is what I want to hear. <laughs> so first of all, we got all this right here. We got here. Oh yeah. We got all over the place. Anywhere for Brian's hammock. You keep going and eventually you're going to see something that's going to blow your mind. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, we set up our tents and stuff inside there, eat and hang out here, and then when it's time to go to sleep, just go back in. How's this compared to the stuff you saw? Oh, way better. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. We started to set up camp. To enjoy the fresh open air, I brought my tarp and carved up some wooden stakes to set it up. Oh my god, I've been waiting for this all day, dude. How does it feel? <laughs> Even better than I could have imagined. I'm gonna have to do this for about 30 minutes before I do anything else. So good luck if you need anything. <laughs> <laughs> Feels good, it's nice and spacious. I just hope the uh, blood-sucking bugs don't all come at me at night. And you, Brian? <laughs> I am living life, living good. Now, we settled into the campsite's back porch to watch the sunset and to cook up some dinner.
Did you think you'd be ending the day like this? <laughs> <laughs> I was getting a little pessimistic at the end there. I was like, man, I don't know. Just think about how much there was left to explore on this island. And we still won't see everything. We'll have to come back a third time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to think that this spot is always here. We can go home, sleep in our own beds, eat a hamburger. This spot is always here, ready to be enjoyed. Mm -hmm. God, that is a great view, though. Mm -hmm. That is just like a sky of hope. We have so many memories associated with this island and Michigan in general. Part of our motivation for coming back here was to relive those memories, to re-experience that which is ingrained in our minds as nostalgia. These landscapes have been a constant in our lifetime, a physical location that connects past to present. And in the process of exploring the past, of revisiting these places, we create new experiences full of wonder and excitement. Now, as the sun set, it was time for us to enjoy our dinner. All right, so I've got fettuccine alfredo with chicken. I've got some beer braised chicken stew from the one and only Marie Fisher, which I'll be sharing with Brian, but I also have this sad looking cup noodles. <laughs> Mm. I don't think I've ever had beer braised stew, but this is mm. like, it doesn't taste like a typical stew. It tastes really unique. Mine is a little less flavorful than I had hoped, mm. but it's hot and plentiful. And that, that's actually all I asked for <laughs> when I'm camping, at least. These sure are cup noodles. <laughs> it's actually good, though. Mm. I want to try that beer braised really quick. I forgot. After dinner, dusk set in, casting the sky in a vibrant, vapor-wave color scheme. <laughs> Actually, when I listen to a really good piece of music and I want to convey the way that I feel when I listen to that piece of music is the same way I feel when I'm trying to convey what this feels like. I want to give somebody else that feeling like, do you, under yeah. do but you it's understand like, how I feel about the, this? The tools feel so inadequate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, this lake is kind of the start. Mm-hmm of us getting into the outdoors. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Sleeping Bear Dunes was the first th place that we went to that really showed us what the outdoors could be. I know that our aunt who lived in Michigan and then also my parents, I feel like they're really good about pushing us to go at least on walks to like parks and gardens and stuff. Our aunt who passed away, she was the original adventure archivist. Every time we'd go on family vacation, she'd have the whole family sit together for a photo and she would take literally 15 minutes to get everybody situated and by the end of it everybody's just yelling take the picture take the picture <laughs> her spirit lives on in the videos that we make now for sure yeah, yeah. so thank you what do you call her i call her dagugu <laughs> i call her ai oh, okay there's a lot of talk about not hanging on to the past and stuff but i do think it's really important to capture memories and be able to like look through them and relive mm. them. Maybe it's just a reminder that there is wonder in the world and like the same kind of wonder you used to see the world with as a kid. It reminds you that there's still that out there. You gotta get that balance. Mm. Enjoy the past, enjoy the present, and look forward to the future. Mm -hmm. And do them all in balance. Yeah, yeah. Living and reliving. <laughs> you gotta live, you gotta relive, and you gotta prepare to live. <laughs> 
and this is gonna be a good sky too. Mm -hmm. I look forward to uh, <laughs> sleeping through these brilliant stars tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Just as the island continued to exist in time, between our childhood memories and our current experience here, the night star swirled above us as we drifted off to a deep, restful sleep. The next day, the sun shined brightly through a blanket of leaves above us. Off in the distance, the water of the lake lapped gently against the shore. It was a perfectly clear, cool morning. I decided to make my way down to the beach to get closer to the water. Okay, this could be a really bad idea, but uh, I kind of want to take a swim in the lake. One, just because it's here and there's a beautiful beach by our campsite. But two, just to see if it'll wake me up a little bit more. But admittedly, when you're outside of the sun, it is a little bit chilly, so hopefully this is not a decision that I end up regretting. This could be a bad idea. The sand hasn't even had time to warm up yet, and it feels kind of cold on the feet. But uh, I'm just going to go for it. Believe it or not, that actually feels really, really good. Oh yeah, just wakes you up immediately. Plus I feel like I kind of needed a bath. Okay. Besides the brisk, refreshing water, this beach was also covered in smooth, colorful stones. It was a peaceful morning. Monarchs rested on milkweed plants, and Robbie came to join me at the beach. I've never seen any water look more inviting in my entire life. <laughs> All right, I already went through the laborious task of drying off and desanding myself, but I think I gotta go back in. <laughs> Sandy, my favorite feeling in the world. <laughs> After enjoying the water, we got dressed, knocked the sand out of our shoes, and headed back to camp. Here, we started slowly packing up our things ahead of the hike out. So, one nice thing about this A-frame shelter is in the morning, you can undo all the stakes and just turn it into a nice lean-to. But that way you can actually gather all your things and pack it up without having to deal with the whole A-frame in your way. But before leaving, we had some special coffee that we wanted to brew up. On the menu was Vietnamese coffee, including churro coffee, lavender coffee, with the addition of sweetened condensed milk. Oh man. Wow, that is strong coffee. Yeah, that's really good. I drank this dark and it was not sour at all. Mm -hmm. This literally tastes like what I used to do at Bob Evans. Whoa! Yeah, that lavender taste is really strong. Can I try any? No, I'm good. You want to try this stuff? Well, I'm going try it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, son. <laughs> Okay, maybe we'll sleep. <laughs> this is how you start a day right here. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's the best one. It's good. Mm -hmm. Actually, I slept really well. I didn't feel cold at all. I was really comfortable. Mm. It was a really nice deep sleep. I did wake up at one point because, like, I think a bug flew into my ear. <laughs> but I, I thought it was like a little rodent crawling across my face or something. 
I definitely saw the like the little big spots that the ranger was talking about. He was also talking about how like the deer are just so acclimated to people that they'll just come into your camp. And he was right. They just they just wander in. This campsite was a really really good find. Yeah. And now there's like not a single cloud in the sky. It's amazing. Good start to the day so far. <laughs> yeah. Now we tore down our shelters, packed our bags, and headed out. hiked back onto the main trail and headed through a small patch of trees that Brian had explored the previous day. Oh, this was the campsite that I scouted out last night before Robbie came and got me. Fortunately, we didn't have to use it. <laughs> Pretty soon, the trail led us to a wide open meadow with an amazing view of the brilliantly blue lake. Wow. <laughs> oh man. Wow. This was the kind of scenery that made this island so amazing to visit. We explored a side trail in search of a way to get down to the lake to fill up on water. I think you might be a little hard pressed to get down here. <laughs> Although there could be something maybe that way. Oh God, I love this island. The colors here, man, it's just like, so beautiful. We continued searching and came across a cozy little nook. Okay, this might have been an even better campsite. I mean, there's less space, but wow, this is, what an ideal place. <laughs> Hopefully this will take us to the water. There's a path leading down here, so I think I could just take the fall. I'll go down, fill up, and then bring them up one at a time, or all together. And there's definitely some signs of people being down there in footprints, so if somebody else could do it, we could do it. I can go down and help. Okay. Robbie and Andrew headed down to the beach to fill up on water. Even though we had just swum this morning, it was exhilarating to again be right on the lake shore, soaking up the sunshine and feeling the cool water. After filling up on water, we found our way back to the main trail and continued on. Now, the trail took us back into the woods. In the forest, we saw some chipmunks and more delicate mushrooms. This section of woods felt distinctly familiar to us. I know that we like to point out that we feel like we're in some other place, but this is like the first time on the island we've been surrounded by hills on both sides, so you can't really see like the ocean or any open areas. And it really feels like we're in Morgan Monroe or something like Hoosier, some place we've been before. It's kind of kind of weird, really. Just a typical Midwest forest. Yeah. On an old log, some slugs feasted on slime molds. Above, the light shined through neon green beech leaves. Large Ganoderma mushrooms grew from an old log alongside a cluster of orange mycena. So all along the forest floor, I'm seeing some familiar plants. This one right here is called Sweet Sicily. Right now, all the seeds have kind of developed and fallen off, but sometimes you can take the seed pods off and kind of crush them, and it smells almost like licorice or anise. I'm also seeing some Jack in the Pulpit, which usually has a really pretty flower in the springtime, but right now it's just the leaves. And there's also trilliums, which kind of look similar because they both have these three leaves, but trilliums are a little more symmetrical. Although much of the forest was made up of smaller trees, Every so often we saw large beech, oak, or maples growing in the middle of them all. It's interesting, these big maple trees over here look like they were almost planted intentionally. I've seen that in other parks too, where you'll just see a suspicious row of old big oak trees, and it used to be like the boundary of a farm. Now, the trail took us back into a pleasant meadow. In the grass grew vibrant wildflowers, like this purple cow vetch these self-heal flowers, sulfur syncofoil, and this aster flower, which housed a goldenrod crab spider eating a fly. So in 
this patch of grass, there's these huge leaves all over. These are called burdock. This is a plant that commonly grows kind of in meadows along the edges of forests. I can tell these are second year burdock because a lot of them have stalks coming up. Um, but with the first year bur burdock, you can pull up the root and eat it like a, actually it's called a gobo in Japanese. But the second year, sometimes the tender stalks you can also eat. If you look closely, you can actually tell that some of the deer have been munching on these. Like all of these stalks and stems have been chewed on and some of the leaves are missing. It's like a tasty meal. <laughs> There's also patches of black locust growing here. This is in the pea family and in the springtime it grows flowers that you can eat. The way you can identify it is the way the leaves are shaped. They're like compound leaves, but also it has these tiny thorns that grow at the terminus of some of the leaves. So growing here is a rose bush. I was thinking it was multiflora rose, which is a common invasive rose that grows in forests and stuff. But looking at it closely, it might actually just be a rose bush that someone planted here. And actually growing right here is a nice little rose. Most of the flowers have already developed into these nice dark fruits called rose hips. Um, and rose hips are like really nutritious, full of vitamins. I don't know if they're heralded for their good taste or anything. I mean, they taste fine, but it's definitely a good source of nutrition and a great wild food. So these are related to like apples and cherries. Kind of fermented smelling almost. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, it's kind of like a... This one tastes a little fermented, but it's got like a, I don't know, it's got like a zing to it. It was kind of mushy like a old pear or apple. A lot of seeds, but it actually tastes pretty good. You wanna try? We continued onward from meadow to forest. Here we saw more fallen trees and logs. We also saw some cow parsnip, the seeds of a jack-in-the-pulpit, New York fern, maidenhair fern, a robin's egg, orange mycena mushrooms, a skittish little chipmunk, and a downy woodpecker. We found a small path leading off the trail that we decided to check out. Oh, there's a little box up there. Park service box or something maybe? Must be. I doubt that this is an old thing. This is probably something the park actually uses. Yeah. Along the forest floor, beautiful meadow grass grew, and there was a great view of the distant lake. But we shortly returned to the main trail and decided to stop for a little break. This place is like paradise, dude. Such a good trip. Mm. I love this island from the little portion we saw last time. Like, we literally hadn't seen anything. <laughs> <laughs> the weather was absolutely perfect, and we took in all the sights and sounds around us as we rested. From here, the sunlight sifted through the canopy, which swayed in the gentle breeze. It was truly a perfect day. After resting a while, we were back on the trail, which continued on through a long stretch of forest. Here and there, we would see large boulders strewn across the forest floor. As we're hiking, we sometimes see these really big rocks and boulders. There's a really big one here. But uh, the reason these are here is because the Great Lakes were created by glaciers that extended all over the area and then left these huge lakes. And while the glaciers were moving along, they left behind these deposits of huge boulders and stones that are kind of strewn all over the place. These glacial erratics are made of a conglomerate of minerals, often including quartzite and jasper. We eventually reached a junction in the trail, pointing to another landmark on the map. 
So eventually we're gonna go this way, maybe find a campsite along the way, but first we're gonna check out what's over here. We love you, Dark Continent. Good night. <laughs> so this is a really, really cool find. Um, this is a mushroom in the Heraceum genus. I believe this one is called bear's tooth fungus, but it's got this really beautiful frosty snowy white look. This is completely edible. If you cut it off, you can cook it and eat it. There's another fungus in this genus called lion's mane that's edible and also known to have medicinal properties. Some people, I think there's some research being done into it about it possibly having cancer curing properties. This would be like such a cool find if you were allowed to cook these. And also it has a nice texture, so if you cook it with like sauces, it'll soak that right up. But between that and the ramps, man, I feel like I could just survive out here for days. <laughs> now we made our way towards a historic barn. Oh my goodness! Out of nowhere, we saw the barn through the leaves and the trees. We decided to take a closer look inside. Wow. You can tell these huge beams have been chopped away at with an axe by hand. Yeah, this is like the, um, the place that Big South Fork, like all these old farm appliances. There's some stalls in here. Wow, dude. What's crazy is this was really a working barn at one point. You can almost picture the animals in here doing their thing. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, that's far enough. There's like missing boards and stuff. So this is called a leaf spring. It's like a shock absorber for old wagons and trucks and cars. But that steel is supposed to be really good for knives if you find some old ones and you can like forge it down into a knife because it's like really strong, good steel. Not far from the barn were the remnants of another structure built out of concrete blocks. I wonder if this was the foundation for a house or something. Almost certainly. Oh, there's a knife over there. Yeah, I know. Really curious if this knife was from back then or if that's new and somebody left it. This design looks too modern. That's what I was thinking. I mean, considering like how old those things look versus that. Yeah. Like between the lighting of the forest and just finding this, it feels like you're stumbling across some sacred ruins. <laughs> There's a knife right here. Garson design. Yeah, so maybe they lived here. They barned over there. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> After exploring the old buildings, we made our way back to the trail, which would continue on to a landmark labeled Crescent City on the map. Here, we saw some agricultural implement, though we were pretty clueless as to what it was used for. Looks like you could climb on the top and then play with that doodad. <laughs> I was thinking, here, it's like a cow, you come up here and then there's like a trough and you go <laughs> That makes no sense. <laughs> no, it's like you put, put this barrel upside down oh, okay. and then the cow comes up here and then drinks from below. Okay, okay. I have no idea what this is for. <laughs> Someone's watching our video and just like, you fool, that's a horse wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> we hiked through more grass, which became more and more overgrown as we hiked further in. Whatever this is, it goes really deep. The grass is really thick. Hopefully it's something worth it, we'll see. But hidden in the grass were natural wonders, like these skippers resting atop a red clover flower, more of these purple cow vetch flowers, and a fawn nursing on a doe. Eventually, the trail led us to the coast. Here, the ground became more and more sandy and led us to some beautiful sand dunes. We gazed out at the beach and decided to explore around a bit. 
we found a cozy little alcove nestled in the trees by the beach. Man, can you imagine just having your tent right here? This would be amazing. <laughs> right next to the water. Yeah, have your hammock set up like right along these trees. <laughs> We stared out into the lake, mesmerized by how this hidden beach, this little slice of paradise, could be both entirely new and deeply nostalgic at the same time. Experiencing this spot on the island filled us with a renewed sense of wonder. The wonder of exploring a new environment, of taking in incredible scenery. Yet everything about this beach also felt completely familiar, like we had relived this idyllic summer's day hundreds of times before. Eventually, we left the beach and returned to the meadows, to the dirt paths, and eventually to the woods. On our way back to the junction, we saw a garter snake slithering along the leaf litter just off the trail. Finally, we made it back to the junction, where we sat to have another short lunch break and review the plans for the next leg of our hike. <laughs> so the center line trail is four miles. We'll get as far in as we can. If we see any good campsites, we just take it. And we'll just make up the difference tomorrow morning. Yeah. Before hiking too long, I had to empty out all of the sand that had gotten in my shoes. Better pull the insole out. Yeah, of now for under the insole, how much is there? <laughs> <laughs> That's like twice as much. <laughs> the centerline trail was a long stretch of relatively flat, uneventful hiking through the woods. Here and there, we saw some down foliage or a tree covered in horse hoof fungus. But other than that, it was just dense woods for miles. Along the trail, I spotted a couple of things, including these herb Robert geraniums. Well, I think Brian spotted these first, but uh, there are some tasty mushrooms. And on top of that, we think we may have found a suitable campsite. So look at this. This thing has been thoroughly eaten by a lot of slugs, but it's still got its nice bright orange color. I think if it weren't for all the slugs, it'd actually be still pretty fresh. But After admiring the chicken of the woods, we inspected the potential campsite. This could be it. I think we should check how far along we are. I'm so torn because this is a bird in the hand, but we could have two birds in one hand out there. <laughs> I'm leaning towards continuing, but if you guys aren't, I'm totally fine with this. I am too. I can keep going. Yeah. I think if Brian can keep going, let's keep going. Yeah, because it's just a flat trail. That didn't mean it's an insult. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's do it. Yep. Not long now. Though we were fairly tired, we continued on, knowing that the lakeside campsite would be well worth the effort. That is, if it wasn't already taken. I'm still feeling pretty good, but I'm really wondering if we're gonna come to regret not staying at that campsite. Besides my legs being tired, I feel good, but I feel like there's gotta be something along the coast we can find. Gotta be, right? Like, even if we gotta scrape the bottom of the barrel, I feel like it'll still be better than that. Yeah. We eventually reached the junction connecting the centerline trail to the lakeshore. Now, we hiked forward with tons of excitement. <laughs> I can taste it. I can feel it. 
It's crazy how fast we're walking now. The motivation is so high. Andrew ran ahead to look for the campsite and see if it was taken. I do hear voices, but I still feel like we can find a spot. Okay. It's definitely tense there. Ah. Wait, this is, no, this is a different one. Yeah, there's another one, right, with the big tree? Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, so whatever's over here is taken, but let's keep going ahead. Oh, wait, yeah, because this is not the meadow yet. This is the first meadow. There's another one up ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's up ahead on the left. You see that kind of foresty bit? Yeah. Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes! <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you, Crom. Thank you, Greedo. Wow. What a campsite. Oh my God. Oh wow. my God. <sighs> Welcome home, Brian. <laughs> Dude, I wanna, I wanna like kiss the ground, right? <laughs> yes. Oh my God, I'm so happy. <laughs> I think I'm realizing we camped in the meadow because this was taken initially. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we saw this and we're like, oh my god, it's a good, it's a good campsite, but this only had it set up. So we walked oh in the meadow god. and we're like, oh, camp here. Oh my god. In the golden glow of the early evening sun, we took in our beautiful surroundings and enjoyed a much earned bit of relaxation. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> Doubly glad we didn't settle on that forest campsite. Yeah. And you were right though, it's like, once we got to that junction, it was just like <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this might be one of the best campsites we've ever had. <laughs> Absolutely. With plenty of room to spread out, we started setting up our shelters before preparing dinner for tonight. What are you having, Brian? It's simple, chicken with broccoli ramen noodles, apparently. I'm also having ramen. This is from Naive Urban Gardener. It is some Nakiryu ramen. And nearby, a couple of white-tailed deer were also enjoying this idyllic campground. poured boiling water into our food, and rested while we waited for them to cook. Then, it was time to eat. Mm, I think, I think, <laughs> this is a pretty sad boy meal right there. <laughs> Yours? This, this ramen is probably worse than Andrew's ramen. <laughs> In fact, it most definitely is. Mmm! Mine's pretty good. This is 95% ramen and 1% sadness. <laughs> There's just nothing to mix up. <laughs> This is sadness in a bowl. Do you want a fork? <laughs> no, it's fine. Okay, mine is good. If you need a little less sadness, you can mm -hmm. have a couple <laughs> bites. <laughs> Yours looks excellent. Yeah, this is. Mm. Mm. You want some of this? Yeah. He's like, yes. <laughs> Get a bite of this while you're at it. <laughs> oh, it smells good. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Mmm, that's good too. Mmm. Mmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now back to my bland meal. <laughs> <laughs> this ramen is super good. I found the broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Peak experiences. Mm -hmm. For Brian, a decent experience. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I wouldn't clock this in a decent. <laughs> I feel like we're gonna sleep early and then get up early to see the sunrise. Oh, seems like mosquitoes are gone now, too. Yeah. After dinner, we walked to the lakeshore to enjoy the brisk air of twilight dusk.
pastel palette of the sky reflected off the calm, rippling water as we sat and reminisced a bit. <laughs> when we were kids, you guys as parents would take us to a cabin on Torch Lake. And then one time we went with all the different cousins and we split up, you guys went to Mackinac Island. And then for some reason I went with some other cousins and we went to this random beach. And I remember taking a rock that looked just like this. And this is like the most staple Lake Michigan rock that exists. <laughs> I feel extraordinarily lucky that we get to go to places like this. Like the fact that we grew up next to a place like this and got to see this since we were kids, mm. it's pretty great. Yeah. Something about a lake like this that just makes every time of day seem magical and nostalgic mm -hmm. and just like full of joy. See the sky? It's yeah. different colors. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful sky right now. I know for sure we are going to sleep good tonight. <laughs> oh yeah. Skip a rock. After that calming evening, it was time for us to head to bed. I think me and Brian both agree that we haven't felt this tired since... After the 12 mile hike on Pictured Rocks. Did we do 12 miles in a day? Yeah. Oh man, yeah, our legs are just, it's... Like you can't lie in any position yeah. where you're comfortable. <laughs> Every position my legs hurt. <laughs> Other than that, it's quite comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, it's great. <laughs> How you doing, Andrew? <laughs> good good all right we'll go to bed early maybe try to catch the sunrise we'll see you guys tomorrow In the morning, we had witnessed an absolutely spectacular sunrise. Afterwards, we had returned to our tents to sleep some more. As the sun rose higher, we slowly awoke once again. In the warmth of the late morning sun, we packed up our gear and took down camp. Before heading out though, we enjoyed a couple of cups of coffee to warm ourselves up as we talked about our nights. Oh, yeah. Ooh, it's still really nice and hot. 
That warms the soul and the body. Speaking of which, that summer bag was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Were you as cold as I was last night? I was fine until I got up to use the bathroom, and then I got really cold. Yeah, I was fine. <laughs> it's funny how quickly it can go from cold to warm. Well, when we were just standing there watching the sunrise, like like a minute after that sun peeked over the horizon, I was like, actually, I could feel myself getting yeah. a little bit warmer. Yeah. Man, what a perfect end to a pretty perfect trip. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> We had wanted to return to North Manitou Island ever since we left it all those years back. We yearned to re-experience its vibrant colors, its refreshing waters and warm beaches, and its pleasant meadows and mesmerizing forests. Michigan has always been a nostalgic state for us, associated with vacations, family get-togethers, and of course, our discovery of the wonders of the natural world. In our yearning for the past, we had created new experiences for ourselves. By trying to relive our memories, we had forged entirely new ones. It's hard not to live in the past, to grasp for distant, dreamlike memories or an idyllic scene filtered through rose-colored glasses. And we shouldn't feel bad about longing for a better past. Instead, we should use that longing as fuel to search for a better future for ourselves and the world. What makes nostalgia so powerful is the sense of wonder you feel for everything as a child. The key to reliving those experiences, then, is to work towards a life that is full of exhilarating, childlike wonder. To live a life of adventure, and to share those adventures with everyone else. about a million times better than it did on the way in. This yeah. is just like easy breezy beautiful cover girl. <laughs> One of those bags had a body in it, I'm pretty sure. Hotel Archives is still back on! <laughs> mm, I love light beer on a sunny day. 
You want any beer? I already stole some. <laughs> There's a bakery over there. We're gonna get a cookie. Then we're gonna go to the ice cream shop. We're gonna get an ice cream. Then we're gonna go to the coffee shop. We're gonna get a coffee. <laughs> I've got a nice springy chair. You've got a nice springy chair. Brian's got one. This will be Thomas. <laughs> My root beer has been taxed. Mm, that was good root beer. I'm so glad we can steal each other's food again. <laughs> ah, you make fine root beer, Henry. You look like D.B. Cooper hiding out in some small town. <laughs> they found me! Did we earn this? Did we actually do enough hiking? <laughs> oh, yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> Polish Reuben dipping sauce? Come on. Oh. I did not err in my judgment. <laughs> Perfect. <clears throat> Cheers, everybody. Mm. Ding, ding. Think it and sink it. You gotta try one of these. These are so oh, good. Oh man, I'm excited. Mm. Give me that shrimp tail. <laughs> Is this our first real post hike meal since COVID? Yeah. Yeah, actually. Wow. What a way to come back, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm. Bink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mayonnaise? Come on, man. Thousand Island. Dipping my fries in every sauce. <laughs> A thousand Manitou Island. <laughs> this time the steak with the peppers are cut. <laughs> this is Thomas in 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. These videos are only possible thanks to viewers like you and our supporters at patreon.com slash adventure. If you'd like to support our channel, check out the link in the description below. Also in the description, you can find a link to our Teespring store where we've got t-shirts for sale with designs like this one, this one, and then we've also got an awesome classic design. If you want another way to support the channel, check out that link. Thank you again so much for watching and we'll see you on our next adventure. That was a good post hike meal. What do you say so, Douglas Jackson? I would say so. What did you want to say, Ann McBride? I was gonna say that Jasper Caparata Hey, Sun Jam, got any jokes for us? Oh, 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 I got a joke. What did Aaron Jones say to DaytonHikers.org? Let's take a hike! That's Fort Expedition Research, LLC. That's where they're holding our villages prisoner. Jason Bourgeois, Gavin Ryan, and John and Lisa Truitt. We need to get them out. I'll rely on your long-range archery skills, Sensei Brian Strom. I'll have to go in there and find the general, Evil McPhee, and his two underlings, John Scott and Arlo T.J. Augustine. You can count on me, Charlie Joe. I'd better get a closer look of the fortress. Over there are some bushes we can hide behind. That window looks like I could sneak into it. And that basketball hoop might be where their soldiers recreate. <laughs> <laughs> you can count on me, Charlie Joe.
<laughs> okay, Chris Tucker. <laughs> Christopher Imsdahl was thought to actually have lived on Earth as one of Egypt's pharaohs. While many scholars have suggested that he worshiped the sun, in my opinion, I think an extraterrestrial event may have occurred in real life. Mary Sin Cabbage was mummified in Egypt. But when I hear a story like that, I have to ask myself the question, could it not have in fact been aliens? It's about time you showed up, Sanwar One. You're the only hope for our world. I'll do my best. Dan Vulcans won't have his way with me. Good luck. Check your Lin Chen systems. Check your Aquia G Diffuser Asare systems. Elaine R. Anthony here. I'm fine. This is Sue and Tan. All systems go. Elise and Bruce Phillips here. I'm okay. This reminds Scott and Colgan to start recording. Let's rock and roll! What's this? This is the money for our next quest. What are we hunting? Christina Alvarez put in a quest to hunt a Rathalos. Do you think you're ready for that? Rathalos, huh? Let's see. It says here it's weak to lightning. Good thing I just upgraded my bow using five Zenogre horns. Have you put your party together yet? Yeah, my party's ready. I've got James Rokitsky, Salvador Gonzalez, and of course, my palico, William Garnett. What about Jeremy? He's too busy. He's training Nessie. She just got accepted into the high rank graduate school. But this quest is on the deserted island. How do you plan on getting there? Well, actually, I took in a few personal favors. And I got Maxwell Bellbot with Bill and Mason to get us a boat from Great Lakes Watercraft. Sounds like a plan. Oh, well, sounds like we better get going. Andrew's face. <laughs> he just like, trying to hold it in. <laughs>